Bom dia a todos. É uma grande honra para nós, da Procuradoria-Geral do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, recebermos o professor Green aqui na nossa casa. O professor Green é, vai ser formalmente apresentado pela doutora Marta Brenner, mas, é, como todos sabem, é um dos maiores constitucionalistas do mundo, uma pessoa que tem muito a nos ensinar. Então, é um grande prazer, uma alegria e uma honra tê-lo aqui. Eu passo a palavra, então, sem mais demora, para a doutora Marta Brenner, que é a nossa presidente de mesa e efetivamente vai fazer a apresentação do professor Green. Só esclarecendo que o Procurador-Geral do Estado é, não pôde estar presente, porque teve um compromisso com o governador nessa manhã, mas é, é, mandou a todos as suas saudações. Bom dia a todos presentes. Foi uma grande honra ter sido convidada para presidir essa mesa, especialmente com o professor Dieter Grimm, que tem um currículo sensacional. É? É, o professor Peter Green, Dieter Grimm é jurista pleno, foi estudante de Direito e Ciências Políticas nas universidades de Frankfurt e Freiburg, na Freie Universität de Berlim, Sorbonne, em Paris, e Harvard. <risos> Ele é mestre em Direito pela Harvard, de, in, foi, teve o título obtido em 1965. É doutor em Direito pela Universidade de Frankfurt, na qual foi livre docente, em período também que atuou no Max Planck Institute de História de Direito Europeu. Em 1979, tornou-se professor de Direito Público na Universidade de Bielefeld, e também, a partir de 1999, foi professor da Humboldt Universität em Berlim, aonde ainda atua como professor. Foi reitor do Instituto de Ciências de Berlim, do qual é membro permanente ativo até hoje. E mais relevante ainda é que Dieter Grimm foi juiz do Tribunal Constitucional Alemão no período entre 1987 e 1999. Profundo conhecedor da Constituição Alemã e do direito constitucional, nos presentei agora com essa palestra sobre o princípio da dignidade humana como novo paradigma em direito constitucional. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Schreiber. Thank you, Dr. Brenner, uh, for giving me. I have to, to, to put that down because I hear myself. <laughs> I think this is okay. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to talk about a, uh, a subject that uh, is rather new in constitutional law, but uh, gaining more and more uh, importance. I think uh, one can even say, if you are looking for a term that characterizes post-World War II constitutionalism, uh, human dignity is a hot uh, uh, candidate. Uh, if you look to the foundational documents of modern constitutionalism, Uh, so, Virginia Declaration of Rights, 1776, uh, uh, U.S. Bill of uh, Rights, uh, 1791, French Declaration of Rights and Freedoms, 1789, you would not find uh, uh, dignity uh, there. Uh, these uh, Bills of Rights and these constitutions Uh, they proclaim equal freedom as an innate right of every person, thereby distinguishing uh, themselves from uh, uh, systems characterized by inequality and the absence of freedom, like in France, or by parliamentary omnipotence, uh, like in England and like in the American colonies, but they do not ground life, liberty, equality in human dignity. In the French Declaration, the word dignity uh, appears. Uh, Tous les citoyens sont également admissibles à toute dignité. All persons are equally admissible to all dignities. But this has nothing to do with the dignity of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, this is more a negation of the old notion uh, of dignity, namely the dignity that was accorded to people who had a certain status or belonged to a certain class. So the dignity of a prince or the dignity of a bishop, a cardinal, uh, etc. So the dignity of dignitaries. Human dignity in a different sense 
uh, appears for the first time in a few constitutions of the first half of the 20th century, yet still not in the sense that it adopted uh, in the second half uh, of the 20th century. In the first half, when you read in constitutional texts the term dignity, it usually is a reaction to the class division uh, of society and to the industrial era and the social problems that went along with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the German constitution of that time, Weimar constitution of 1919, we celebrate uh, the anniversary uh, next year as we celebrate the anniversary of the current German constitution, the basic law also uh, uh, next year. So the paradigmatic uh, constitution is uh, Article 150 of the Weimar constitution, it reads, the economy must be regulated according to the principles of justice with the aim of guaranteeing everybody a dignified life. And dignified life means shelter, food, housing, clothing, uh, uh, etc. So the bare necessities of life. This was the use of dignity if it appears in a constitution in the first half of the 20th century. One, only one exception as far as I know, uh, and this is the Irish Constitution of 1937, which was heavily influenced by the Catholic Church in Ireland, and which declares it an objective of the state to guarantee the dignity and the freedom of the individual. But uh, without this exception of Ireland, uh, 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 dignity uh, became predominant only in the second half of the 20th century. And apparently, it needed the uh, atrocities uh, committed by totalitarian systems like Stalin's Soviet Union or Hitler's uh, Third Reich in Germany, and it needed the horrors of uh, the war to realize that it was not enough to guarantee a number of liberties, such as habeas corpus or freedom of religion or freedom of speech, whatever you want, but what there was a feeling that one needed an overarching principle in which all the various liberties were grounded and which gave to these liberties a certain uh, coherence and a certain direction. And this principle, after uh, World War II, was human dignity. The first post-war document where dignity appears in this emphatic uh, uh, sense is the preamble of the UN uh, Charter of 1945. Uh, the charter was followed by a number of constitutions of the German states. Germany is a federal state. And uh, after Germany lost uh, World War II, uh, not immediately the Federal Republic emerged, but uh, uh, the, the various states were refounded. Hitler had abolished federalism. So you find constitutions of the years 1946, 1947, almost all having a guarantee uh, of human dignity. Then, of course, dignity features very prominently in the uh, Universal Declaration of Rights, 1948, 70th anniversary uh, this year in uh, December. And then, uh, 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 perhaps the most uh, influential one, Article 1 of the German Basic Law of 1945. It was afterwards adopted by a large number uh, of states mostly states that had freed themselves from authoritarian systems or military dictatorships uh, or other authoritarian regimes. It started 1975 with Southern Europe, uh, Spain and Portu Portugal abolished uh, uh, their dictatorships and turned to constitutional democracy. Uh, then, of course, a big wave 1989 when the communist system uh, collapsed uh, but other parts of the world as well. South Africa is a prominent uh, uh, example. And the Brazilian constitution, uh, uh, which I think is now 30 years uh, of age, also contains a uh, uh, guarantee of dignity. So I think this confirms that there is a, a causal uh, nexus uh, between the guarantee of dignity and the experience of atrocities that were committed by previous uh, regimes. And uh, this is, in, uh, uh, in addition, it is confirmed uh, when we see that if we look to countries that don't have an experience like that, an experience with a, sub, a suppressive, oppressive regime, 
uh, or with dictatorship, you wouldn't find dignity. Canada is an interesting example. Canada got a Bill of Rights in 1982 only. It had a constitution before, but it was only a procedural, organizational uh, document. It got a uh, Bill of Rights, a Charter of Rights, 1982. You will not find dignity there. The same is true for the British Human Rights Act of 1998. Uh, again, uh, no mentioning of dignity there, and I think the explanation is that these states had a long-lasting uh, uh, democratic and rule of law tradition, so the need that was felt uh, uh, after these oppressive regimes in other parts of the world was not as salient uh, in uh, uh, these countries uh, like uh, Canada and uh, like uh, the UK. But even in countries uh, without a textual guarantee of dignity, more and more judges in opinions that they write, uh, turn to dignity. For Canada, this is very clear. The Canadian Supreme Court uh, recognizes uh, dignity as a uh, value to which the Charter of Rights wanted to give uh, expression. So they explain and interpret the Charter Rights in the light of uh, dignity. And uh, more and more uh, dignity could also be found in the uh, jurisprudence of the U.S. Supreme Court. There were some judges, I think the most, uh, though, who liked to uh, refer to dignity. The one who liked it most left the Supreme Court recently. This was Justice Kennedy. For him, dignity was a very important uh, uh, word. But I think it's still more or less in the U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence. is more or less a word. It has not yet become a legal uh, notion. So this is a very short look into the history uh, of, uh, uh, of dignity. And uh, let me now turn uh, uh, to the legal problems, and it creates a lot of legal problems. Uh, uh, what is the legal nature of that uh, principle? What is its meaning? Uh, all countries whose constitutional law contains uh, a guarantee of dignity are confronted with these uh, questions. Dignity is not self-explanatory. Uh, the notion is extremely vague, even compared to other fundamental rights, fundamental rights anyway are very vague, but dignity uh, is even uh, more uh, vague and uh, uh, open-ended. Uh, however, uh, uh, although so many constitutions now contain guarantee of dignity, uh, there uh, uh, is uh, no consensus. Uh, as to what it really is and uh, uh, what it means. So the specific constitution and the context uh, of that constitution uh, accounts, for which is the, the method of interpretation that a country uh, adopts counts, the legal culture in which this term appears uh, plays a role. For, for instance, in some countries, dignity appears only in the preamble of the constitution. Then it is doubtful whether it's a legal norm at all or whether it's only a political proclamation. If it is in the Constitution itself, there is no doubt that it is a legal norm, but what sort of a legal norm? So in Germany, we have a discussion whether dignity is only an objective principle or also a subjective right. What is the difference? If it is an objective principle, it binds the government, but it does not entitle individuals. If it is a fundamental right, it binds the government and entitles uh, individuals. Uh, the German Constitutional Court never ruled on that question, but it treats digni dignity as if it were a right. So if someone brings an individual complaint to the German Constitutional Court based on uh, an alleged violation of dignity, the court accepts this claim and doesn't uh, uh, reject it and doesn't refuse to treat it. So this means that he has, thank you, that the court, uh, uh, although never having said it explicitly, implicitly understands dignity as a right, not only as a uh, principle. <clears throat> Who is the addressee? Certainly government, but the formulation in the German basic law, for instance, allows also an understanding that everybody is the addressee uh, uh, of dignity. I think the answer has to be derived from the 
function of fundamental rights. They limit government. They don't limit uh, individuals. The individuals are the beneficiaries of fundamental rights. And uh, unless the Constitution explicitly says something else, we would say that fundamental rights only apply to the government. They bind the government in the interest of the freedom of uh, the individual. Uh, if uh, uh, constitutions do not tell anything else, like uh, 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 in Germany, uh, uh, individuals cannot violate the constitutional guarantee of human dignity. They may treat other individuals in the way that is incompatible with their dignity, but this is not a violation uh, of the rights of dignity. Uh, this uh, means that uh, 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 individual uh, means that does not mean that everybody is free to treat other individuals in a non-dignified uh, way, but it is gives a, an obligation, a duty, a positive duty of the, date, the state to protect these individuals against assault of their dignity from uh, uh, other uh, uh, citizens. And the, uh, the, the, the state does that usually in formulating laws that, for instance, criminalize attacks on human dignity by uh, other people. Criminal law is full of such uh, protection. But what if something is not protected, which we could perhaps regard as a, an assault of, uh, 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 of dignity? Uh, if you look to the jurisprudence of the United States Supreme Court, the answer is clear. There's a very famous case called Tisheni, some of you will know it, uh, where the court says the purpose of fundamental rights is to protect the people from the state, not to ensure that the state uh, is protected, uh, no, that the state protected them from each other. So there is a clear negation of a third party horizontal effect uh, of fundamental rights and especially dignity. Not so in Germany. Article 1 reads, human dignity shall be inviolable to respect and to protect. It shall be the duty of all state authority. Respect means the government itself must not violate human dignity. Protect means the government has to prevent private actors from violating uh, dignity. This formula, respect and protect, is singular in the German constitution. Uh, it is not repeated in connection with other uh, fundamental rights. Other fundamental rights are not accompanied by such a duty to protect on the side of the state. But the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court uh, uh, allows to understand fundamental rights not only as negative rights, namely to uh, uh, keep uh, the uh, government in distance uh, and oblige the government to refrain from certain actions, but also as positive rights that oblige the government to take action if menaces to individual freedom emanate not from the state, not from the government, but from private actors. Not only individual actors, but also organized private actors, companies, organizations, uh, etc. And how does the state protect? Usually in, uh, uh, in that way that it makes laws that protect the freedom of the individual by limiting the freedom of those who pose a risk to the freedom uh, of others. It's a duty to legislate, not in the US, not in Canada, for instance, but uh, uh, certainly in Germany and in many other European states, and as far as I see also in Brazil. So this uh, would be in the United States, would be some of, sort of a sensation. It's certainly not uh, uh, in Brazil. Another important question is uh, human dignity itself subject to limitation. All fundamental rights are subject to uh, limitation. And we are inclined to say, yes, of course, if human dignity is a fundamental right, there must be a possibility to limit it because everybody can use any right to harm others. And every right can enter into a collision with a, another right. Uh, 
so limitations are inevitable. In Germany, to the contrary, human dignity is understood as an absolute right. Here I'm not sure, I'm not knowledgeable enough to say what the Brazilian uh, interpretation is, but we'll have a discussion, I hope, and maybe I hear something uh, about that. So Germany says human dignity is an absolute right. Uh, the court derived this from the text uh, of Article 1. Uh, and there human dignity is declared, and I, now I have to use a German word to show you the difference, because in all English translation the difference appears. The German word is unantastbar. Unantastbar, a direct, uh, literal uh, translation would be untouchable. Dignity is untouchable. And this term is used only in connection with dignity. Other fundamental rights, uh, the term that is used is unverletzlich, inviolable. inviolable. But in translations in English, both German terms that are differentiated are, uh, are uh, translated into inviolable. And then you can see that there is a, a difference. And for the German constitutional court, this difference had a, a meaning, uh, namely that uh, uh, it is to be regarded as an absolute right. Now, what does that mean if a right, if a fundamental right is regarded as absolute right? The first thing we said already, no limitation can be justified. Otherwise, it would be not an absolute right, but a relative right. That's to say, no infringement of human dignity is justifiable. There is no balancing. If there is a conflict of other human, other human rights, other fundamental rights, and dignity, there is no balancing. Otherwise, dignity would not be uh, uh, absolute. So dignity, if it is involved, always trumps. And one has to see that this has a number of interesting consequences. The first consequence is if you want to be, if you want to have a right as an absolute right, that's to say no limitation, no balancing, you have to define it narrowly. If you define it very broadly, it's almost inescapable that you need uh, uh, limitations. Uh, so, a very narrow scope, that's to say, human dignity as an absolute right, like Germans uh, have it, uh, is there only f for the very essence of personhood and individual autonomy. All the rest, all the many other violations of rights are left to the following rights in the Constitution, but are not included in, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, dignity. Uh, the second consequence is human dignity, if understood as absolute right, cannot cover actions of individuals because every individual action can create harm to some one other and then you may want to limit it. So human dignity only protects you against being, against being treated in an undignified way by others, but it doesn't protect your actions. Otherwise, you couldn't uphold it as uh, uh, absolute. And the third consequence is, uh, uh, if you are in favor of absolute rights, you can only have one. Uh, as soon as you have two, and these two enter into conflict, you have to decide which one prevails and which one stands back, and then uh, it's no longer uh, absolute. So these are the consequences. And uh, 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 in view of these consequences, one has to decide to make up one's mind whether one wants absolute rights or uh, uh, or not. What if dignity stands against dignity? Let me postpone that question. It becomes important for a, an interesting case uh, that I will mention uh, toward the end of my talk. So keep that in mind. What if, if dignity is on both sides and enters into, uh, into conflict? Uh, now, <coughs> let me say that the German understanding is, of course, not compulsory. There are a number of countries that have dignity and give dignity a high value, but don't understand it as absolute right. That's to say, it is one right like freedom of speech or like protection of property or freedom of religion, etc. And uh, it has a certain elevated importance, but it can be limited, it can be balanced. So dignity in these countries where it's not absolute can, in certain constellations, be uh, on uh, uh, the, the losing side. 
I would now uh, like to spend a few moments on uh, the meaning uh, of dignity, which is perhaps the, uh, uh, the most difficult uh, uh, question. Legal norms are enacted in order to take uh, uh, effect, proactively to guide human behavior, retroactively uh, to judge whether behavior complies uh, with the norm or violates the norm, and this presupposes knowledge of what is included in the scope of that right and what is excluded. It requires a definition uh, of the scope. And this is the day-to-day -day job uh, of legal scholars and legal practitioners and certainly of constitutional courts. And it can be uh, less difficult or can be uh, more difficult depending on uh, the text of the constitution, the age of the norm, the nature of uh, the case. For fundamental rights, it's particularly difficult because very often there's just one word to describe the scope, religion, or press, or media, etc. No explanation. So this makes it uh, uh, quite uh, uh, different. And also the limitation clauses are very often extremely broad. Uh, but I think uh, with dignity, we have even more difficulties with uh, compared to uh, other fundamental rights. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I think this difficulty uh, uh, prompts a number of scholars, also a number of courts, uh, to warn uh, us of using dignity as uh, a legal uh, notion. Uh, they say it's not open to legal reasoning. Uh, it opens itself to whatever uh, a judge or whoever interprets it, understands by it, so it's open to subjectivism, and we should better forget about uh, uh, dignity. This is not my uh, attitude to it. I admit it is difficult. Uh, it can be very difficult, uh, but if it is in the Constitution, I wouldn't feel free uh, to say it's just there, but it doesn't have any meaning, and so we avoid it. But how to do it now? This is, of course, uh, a big question, how to ascertain uh, the meaning. We use which source? Historic roots, uh, perhaps. As I said, dignity is rather new in law, certainly new in constitutional law. It's old in philosophy, and it is old in theology. So maybe the framers of a constitution were inspired by philosophy or theology. But does this mean that we can determine the legal term in the light of a certain philosophical school or in the light of a certain theological uh, school. Uh, even if we leave the practical difficulties aside, which makes it uh, problematic uh, enough, so for instance, if there should have been influence of philosophy or theology which one, and which one had the particular member of a constituent assembly in mind, maybe a totally different one from other members of uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> constituent assembly. And uh, how did they interpret this uh, theory? Uh, what if various concepts are competing? How can we prove influence? All these are practical questions of extreme uh, difficulty. But I think more important is uh, that uh, a notion, be it philosophical or be it theological in the origin, is uh, uh, transferred into a different context if it becomes part of a legal document. And this transformation disconnects it from uh, the historical roots, not uh, in the way that there is a complete change of meaning, but in the way that a direct inference from extra-legal sources is uh, uh, prohibited. Uh, rather, uh, the, uh, the legal process in which the notion was accepted as a constitutional notion uh, is important. Historical experiences on which the frame was built or to which they wanted to react is of importance. The interplay of a norm of a constitution with other provisions in the same legal document is decisive. Uh, the content may then come close to philosophy or may come close to uh, theological roots, but as a result of an autonomous legal 
uh, reasoning. So for instance, the Federal Constitutional Court very often in opinions uh, where dignity plays a role uses language that reminds of the, one of the most famous philosophers, Kant, who used dignity in his philosophical word, work uh, uh, quite often. The most important uh, use of it is the so-called object formula of the Kantian philosophy. Every person should always be treated as an end, never merely as a means. But the court never referred to Kant, although it used Kantian uh, uh, language. And of course, Kant taught at the change of the 18th to the 19th century. Uh, and uh, uh, the constitutional guarantee was adopted after World War II. So I think it's much more promising to ascertain the meaning of such a, a vague uh, formula by asking what caused people, now German case, in 1949, 150 years after Kant, to adopt uh, dignity. And that leads to a historical interpretation and to the context, context of the enactment. Uh, the source, this is a source of illumination. It's not binding, but it is a source of illumination. By the way, there are no, when I say historical interpretation, I have not American originalism in mind. In German, there is no originalist. And uh, uh, I, I guess this is the same here. Uh, but in America, as you know, it's a fight bit in, in, in within uh, the Supreme Court whether originalism is the only correct way to interpret constitutional law or, or not. Uh, so the question is less how the framers understood the term, but the question is more what the purpose uh, uh, or what the function was that the guarantee had to fulfill. And then we, if we take again the German context, it became quite clear that the basic law was drafted in a fresh memory uh, of uh, uh, the Nazi uh, period and the atrocities by the Nazis. So the, the underlying motive of the German constitution is never again. And with never again, uh, it is meant never again the self-destruction of a democracy as we uh, experienced it in 1933, and never again the total neglect of human rights as we also experienced it in the 12 years of, uh, of Nazi regime. So this uh, background may serve as a starting point for interpreting such a difficult notion as human dignity. And as a matter of fact, the Constitutional Court started uh, its explanation of dignity by referring to the Nazi atrocities as the clearest examples of what dignity should prevent uh, in the future. Uh, this means that dignity in the beginning was construed in a negative way. The court defined what is a violation of dignity. It avoided a positive definition of dignity. And I think in general, uh, one can say it's always easier to tell what is not meant uh, than to tell what is positively uh, 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 meant. However, as uh, there is an anti-Nazism consensus uh, in German uh, society, uh, there are meanwhile also some positive features that are uncontested about uh, dignity. Dignity is understood as an inherent uh, quality of every human being, not depending on belonging to a specific group, a specific race, a specific religion, independent of someone's capacity to self-determination, independently of someone's intellect or uh, physical or mental conditions. Dignity in the German understanding is not acquired by leading a good life or by do doing good things, and consequently it is not forfeited by leading a bad, bad life, by doing bad deeds. Even the most abominable criminal cannot be uh, deprived of his or her uh, dignity. Even a terrorist has dignity in this meaning. That does not mean, however, that uh, uh, the application uh, of uh, guarantee of human dignity is limited to cases uh, that come close to a repetition of the Nazi atrocities. 
then we wouldn't have any use for dignity up to now. Uh, these are the clearest examples what dignity excludes, but it doesn't exhaust it. Uh, the adoption of dignity shows that more was at stake than a number of individual liberties. Something that is a common ground for the various rights gives these rights meaning, explains them more fully. That's to say, dignity added something to the traditional uh, uh, Bill of Rights for which no necessity was perceived before uh, uh, World War II. And this surplus value, so to say, has to be ascertained from analogies uh, that may be drawn from newer uh, layers uh, of meaning. This shows at the same time that dignity does not necessarily have the same meaning in uh, uh, every legal system. In countries with a racist past, like uh, uh, South Africa, for instance, uh, dignity is strongly linked to equal treatment. Uh, in countries where the working classes were exploited, uh, uh, dignity is very much linked to the basic elements of the dignified uh, life. So there may be different accents of what you stress and emphasize when uh, uh, you deal with dignity, and this is dependent on the legal system in uh, which you work. Normally, uh, normal is that uh, uh, dignity ha is, has an overarching value. And, uh, 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 but it will have a different origins and will have different connotations for different people and also for different members of the constitu constituent assembly. So I think for a Christian probably, Christian may combine different ideas with dignity. Uh, a, a, a humanist or uh, someone who is influenced by enlightenment will have a different idea of uh, dignity. There can even be a Marxist interpretation, a Marxist uh, background of dignity. And I think this openness, this openness, this unclarity, which usually as lawyers we would find is a deficit, has also a good side because it allows so many people to reunite, reunite themselves under the roof uh, of dignity because it's possible that what they understand as dignity they think is covered in uh, uh, the Constitution. The Constitution, the Assembly did not decide on which tradition to build. It only decided to make dignity the foundational norm of the Constitution and the enactment as law neutralizes the ideological background. Therefore, uh, uh, it would not be legitimate for an interpreter to define the meaning by adhering directly to one background theory only. Consequently, inconsistency of the interpretation that the court gives of dignity does not qualify this interpretation as philosophers very often think. They say, oh, this court defines dignity in contradiction to Kant, so it is a wrong understanding of dignity. But this is forgetting, of course, that legal norms are disconnected from their philosophical background. And it may even be unclear whether they have this or another uh, uh, background. Generally speaking, every, every reference to non-legal sources or every insight from other disciplines must be translatable into a legal argument and must fit into the legal uh, environment in which dignity uh, appears. Yeah, let me toward the end of my speak and having in mind that I left one question open, namely what happens if dignity uh, enters into conflict with dignity. Uh, let me discuss this. Uh, by describing a very important case that the German Constitutional Court decided uh, uh, a few years ago, namely in 2006. It was a, uh, uh, was a case where dignity played an important role. Maybe I should add for a moment for better understanding. Remember that I said if you want to have dignity as an absolute right, you need to narrow the scope very much. So this means that there are not too many cases that were decided just according to human dignity. But there are hundreds and thousands of cases where human dignity, so to say, inspired 
the understanding, the interpretation of other rights gave them a broader scope, deepened the understanding. So a lot of dignity in combination with other rights, not too many cases where dignity was the decisive article of the Constitution. In this case that I'm now describing, uh, this is uh, uh, the case. This was an anti-terrorist, uh, anti-terrorism law. Uh, the law was called the Aviation Security Act and it was enacted by the German Parliament in 2005 and the law authorized uh, the German Air Force to shoot down a plane that was targeted against human life if this was the only way to fend off the attack and the power to decide whether the preconditions of using this possibility were given uh, uh, the power to decide was vested into the Minister of Defense. Uh, you can see that the law was prompted by the events of 9-11 uh, and uh, the law raised a number of constitutional questions which I leave uh, aside and I concentrate only on the, uh, on the dignity uh, questions. So the dignity question was, is it allowed to sacrifice innocent lives in order to save the equally innocent lives of, of others. And you can see that then we have uh, 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 this problem. So there is no doubt that the law infringed the right to life. This is Article 2 in the German Constitution. Dignity, Article 1, right to life, uh, Article 2. Yet right to life, different from dignity, is not an absolute right. Right to life can be limited in exceptional cases. But and the limitation clause is very broad. It says uh, uh, this uh, right may be interfered with only pursuant to law. Now we have the proportionality principle not in uh, uh, the Constitution but developed by the Constitutional Court and this makes it less dangerous that there is such a broad limitation clause to such an important right like right uh, to life. But uh, uh, it is clear right to life is not an absolute right. And uh, uh, it can be limited uh, if uh, uh, there is a real uh, pressing uh, reason uh, to do that. So without having proportionality, that would be very uh, uh, disquieting, but we have uh, proportionality. Now, if we uh, would uh, handle this case of the constitutionality of the aviation security case, if you would handle it according to uh, only to the right of to life, Article 2, uh, uh, then we would ask, uh, does the law have a legitimate purpose? Of course, saving life is a legitimate purpose. Uh, is it a suitable means? Of course, if the plane is down, then it cannot be directed into the target. And uh, is it necessary to reach it? And the necessity is also already inbuilt into the law because it says if it's the ultimate possibility that remains, only then may uh, you do it. Uh, and, uh, 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 and then the question is, uh, is it a proper balance? So we discuss, again, we discuss it only under terms of right to life. Then we would probably reach the end, how many people are in the plane? how many people are in the building uh, 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 in, in which the plane is directed. And let's say a normal uh, uh, plane, 300 people and maybe 3,000 people in uh, the, the building. Then if we would have to do it only with the right to life, we'd say we sacrifice 300 to, in order to save 3,000. Uh, and here dignity comes in. Here dignity comes in. The Federal Constitutional Court said it is an infringement of uh, the right to life and the right to life can be legally infringed but never in a way that is incompatible with dignity. It is an absolute right. So you can take, you have the permission to take life if you have very good reasons for it but not if uh, this uh, uh, measure would violate the uh, the dignity uh, of others. So all of a sudden, since we have the absolute understanding, counting numbers is no longer available uh, as an argument. Uh, and this was the situation uh, uh, for the court. And now we see that dignity stands against dignity. 
the people on the ground who will be killed if the plane is not shot down uh, are not less uh, dignified than the people in the plane who are killed if the plane is shot down. Uh, the uh, state has a constitutional obligation vis-a-vis -vis both people in the plane, people on uh, the ground. People in the plane whose life is menaced by the state, state has a duty to respect. People on the ground whose life is menaced by the hijackers, state has a duty to protect. Is one duty stronger than the other? Is the duty to respect stronger than the duty to protect? The Constitutional Court said uh, a uh, state that kills innocent passengers and innocent crew, treats them as a mere means to an end, turns them into objects, into things, so to say, and deprives them of uh, all rights. And this is regarded as a violation of dignity and the duty to protect has no greater weight uh, uh, than this. So it ultimately, if I interpret it uh, correctly, I was no longer at the court, I was not involved in deciding the case. If I interpret it correctly, it's ultimately the difference uh, between the actors. The state here as actor shooting down the plane, the perpetrators there as actors uh, 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 directing the tr uh, plane uh, uh, into the uh, target. Uh, if the state can save life menaced by the perpetrators only by violating the dignity of others, the state is barred uh, from doing it. The state cannot voluntarily kill people uh, in order to save uh, uh, others. And uh, so the law was declared uh, unconstitutional. Uh, the uh, Court edit, uh, the, the outcome is different uh, if no innocent people are in the plane. So if only the hijackers are in the plane, because they are not treated as mere objects if the plane is shot down, they bear the consequences of their free will decision to capture a plane and to do that. The court also said we don't talk about war in this case, uh, and the court said we don't talk about what criminal law uh, uh, says with regard, let's say, to the minister that gives the, uh, the order or to the pilot that shoots uh, the plane uh, down. Uh, do I have two or three minutes? Uh, uh, it was interesting that a German playwright uh, used this uh, uh, decision of the Constitutional Court for a play. Uh, and the scenario was uh, uh, this. Uh, that uh, 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 hijacked plane uh, was directed into uh, to the Olympic Stadium in Munich where just an international match of Germany, I've forgotten against whom, uh, was underway, 70,000 people in the stadium. Uh, so uh, uh, the Minister of Defense asked German planes to start and to see whether they can push this plane aside so that it is not directed and they said it, it, it will not happen, it's unsuccessful. And then the minister complied with the constitutional court judgment and said then sorry, I cannot give the order that you shoot the plane down. The pilot found that uh, impossible and the pilot decided to act or play, yeah? not, not reality. The pilot decided to shoot uh, the plane down and the play is the criminal procedure against uh, uh, the pilot. Uh, it is well, very well done, it's very much uh, uh, built on the arguments, the pro and con arguments uh, in the constitutional uh, uh, court. And now the interesting thing was that uh, after uh, the pleadings of the uh, prosecutors and the pleading of the defense attorney, uh, there was a pause and after the pause, the audience was asked to enter through uh, two doors, the guilty door, the non-guilty door. And this play was performed in many theaters all over Germany, and there was someone who collected the outcome and published it on the internet, so you could always look uh, uh, how many performances were for guilty, how many were for not guilty. And uh, the majority was, the majority was uh, for uh, not guilty. 
so the majority of the audiences in the theater uh, said also implicitly that the judgment of the Constitutional Court was a, uh, a, a, a wrong <laughs> uh, a, a, a judgment. Now, uh, it's difficult to find a middle way between guilty and non-guilty, either or. Yeah? But I think sort of a middle way exists. Uh, and I have another example of German recent uh, history where uh, the, uh, the, the young son of a very wealthy Frankfurt banker was kidnapped by a law student, by the way. And uh, uh, the kidnapper was very soon arrested, but he wasn't willing to tell where he had hidden the child. So the police chief of Frankfurt threatened him with torture. And under torture, he spoke, uh, and the child was there. He, he had killed the child immediately after kidnapping the child. Uh, so not only the kidnapper was tried in court, this is not our problem, uh, but the police chief of Frankfurt was tried in court uh, because of uh, applying torture. And he said, I never meant to apply torture. I only wanted to use this means in order to make him speak. I would never have applied it. But of course, the argument is, did the person who is protected by uh, the uh, uh, prohibition of torture didn't know it, of course. He had to face the situation that he would have been tortured. So the police chief of Frankfurt was condemned, but he was not sentenced. That's to say the court said we recognize, we recognize the very difficult situation in which this person uh, acted. Uh, and we recognize the honest motives uh, that he had, so we declare him guilty, but we don't send him to, to jail. And so maybe in the theater there should perhaps be a, a third door. Uh, guilty, uh, but uh, not condemned. Well, this is the end of what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah, please. Yes. Ok, obrigada, do, é, professor Dieter Grimm, pela excelente palestra. E fica aberto aqui a, 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 para as perguntas do público, que o professor Dieter está muito curioso para receber o feedback da, da plateia. Professor Grimm, vielen Dank por ir em Vortrag. É, não vou falar em alemão. Obviamente, até porque o meu alemão não é tão bom assim, é, apesar de eu já ler muito bem. É, aliás, o senhor é uma referência corrente na minha tese de doutorado. É, eu, enfim, vou dar seguimento em português mesmo. É, o senhor falou muito bem, é, claro, sobre as virtudes do princípio e da noção de dignidade humana. É, eu gostaria que o senhor falasse um pouquinho para a gente sobre os problemas da dignidade humana. Há na Alemanha, por exemplo, quem fale em tirania da dignidade. É, tirinai da... Uh, tirani uh, der Würde. E por quê? Essa, na verdade, o que o senhor trouxe aqui para a gente, basicamente, foi uma ideia, uma concepção material de dignidade humana. É, que é muito embasada na filosofia moral de Kant. Onde o homem não pode uhum. ser utilizado como um meio para fins. Mas há uma outra concepção kantiana também, que não é ligada à filosofia moral de Kant, e sim à filosofia política de Kant, onde a ideia de dignidade é ligada à ideia de que o homem deve ser considerado em sua capacidade de autodeterminação. Esse debate entre uma concepção baseada na filosofia moral e outra concepção baseada na filosofia política de Kant era presente já no Conselho Parlamentar, é, entre Adolf Susterhen e o professor Carlos Schmid. Uhum, uhum, uhum. É, em última análise, essa, há quem diga, por exemplo, se eu não me engano, o professor Christopher Mollers, é, se eu não me engano, ele fala que é, essa concepção material de dignidade, fortemente baseada é, no cristianismo é, é, do professor uhum. Susterhen, uhum. teve uma certa primazia de... É, 
é, no desenvolvimento posterior do constitucionalismo alemão, basicamente por força do mito do marco zero, é, Stund Null, é, auf Deutsch. É, por quê? Porque essa noção de uma leitura material, um, ela era mais propícia numa sociedade fechada, nos termos utilizados por Karl Popper. É, segundo, ela também era mais útil é, para grande parte dos juristas que permaneceram em seus cargos, esses mesmos juristas que permaneceram em seus cargos, é, foram, em grande medida, é, é, não testemunhas, foram, em grande medida, é, cúmplices do regime nazista. Então, essa leitura de dignidade, uma leitura material do direito, seria mais útil para que esses juristas conseguissem esconder a sua parcela de culpa. Então, o professor Christopher Muller, é, se eu não me engano, sugere uma noção, é, o resgate de uma noção formal de dignidade, onde a dignidade seja lida no contexto da ideia de democracia. Ou seja, a dignidade ela perderia essa primazia axiológica, valorativa no ordenamento, para se tornar quase que apenas como um lembrete. Ela teria uma... Até porque ele constata que a dignidade normalmente vem sempre acompanhada de outro princípio, ou liberdade, ou vida. Ela muito raramente, até como o senhor mesmo disse, ela raramente é utilizada por si só. Então, nós deveríamos redequalizar a ideia de, de dignidade uhum. numa leitura instrumental, preservando quase como um lembrete dos fundamentos da constituição da sociedade dando continuidade a uma tradição liberal uhum. é, de, 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 da leitura desse princípio. Então, gostaria só que o senhor falasse um pouco para a gente dos problemas da dignidade uhum. nesse contexto de déficit de democracia uhum. e como que a gente pode realmente compatibilizar a noção de dignidade de uma leitura formal, se ela é compatível ou não. Enfim, eu gostaria que o senhor esclarecesse um pouquinho isso uhum. para a gente. Uhum. Thank you. I, I see how... how familiar you are. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see how familiar you are with the debate uh, in the uh, Parliamentarische Rat uh, on, on dignity. Uh, and uh, the person uh, you mentioned uh, first, uh, a deputy named Süßehen was a, uh, how should I say, a very strong Catholic. And he certainly, he certainly understood by dignity what uh, the Christian interpretation would be. So everybody is an imago, an image of God. This is the foundation of uh, a person's dignity. Uh, but if he had said only this uh, is uh, the correct understanding of dignity, I'm sure that neither the social democrats nor the liberals would have consented to it. Uh, and uh, the one who finally found uh, the wording Uh, was Theodor Heuss. He was the first president of Germany after the war, and he was a liberal, and he was not religious at all. Uh, so that there was one with a strong idea of Christian notion of dignity uh, doesn't say that this was the generally accepted notion. And I think I would like to repeat it once more, the possibility that so many people could combine what they understood as dignity made it su such, a, uh, such a successful uh, notion. And we shouldn't uh, uh, rate it uh, too low. Uh, and I would say uh, uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a lot of consensus in Germany about the meaning of dignity or the limits of dignity, but there is by no means a total uh, consensus. There is, uh, there is a field of consensus This covers, for instance, the fact that it is an inherent quality that does not depend on whether you lead a good life or a bad life. Yeah? Even the worst person uh, should not be treated in an undignified way, even if he or she is sent sentenced in, uh, to the hardest, harshest uh, 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 punishment, uh, whatever. So this is certainly consented. For a long time, Uh, the absolute character was consented. This is no longer true. A number of years ago, in a very influential commentary, a new commentator said, uh, we cannot uphold that. Uh, and his idea was, there are now new problems that have to be solved under the notion of dignity than those of the Nazi period. They have, fortunately enough, not reappeared in Germany. So he said, we have now different things. We have 
uh, everything that goes around stem cell research is the is the stem cell uh, uh, already endowed with uh, dignity we have to uh, discuss uh, cases of reproduction of life uh, with uh, all modern techniques biological techniques that we know that raise questions of dignity uh, so his idea is uh, it's no longer possible to keep it uh, as an absolute but uh, this was a lot of protest so he uh, he, uh, for a while, more or less, uh, uh, remained alone. And people who recognize that these problems that I just mentioned, examples of that, uh, that have to be solved legally, people uh, agree that one shouldn't use too early the notion of dignity uh, and to start too early, so to, 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 to begin with the stem cell and already endow dignity to the stem cell. So this is the answer, but not to give up the absolute character. But there is a lot of discussion, and it comes from various sides. Uh, you mentioned Christoph Möller's and his ideas of uh, democracy, my colleague at Humboldt University. And, uh, well, I think that I would argue in a way saying that democracy is the political form that is best compatible with my understanding of dignity. You know? And I would not... Uh, uh, derive the meaning of dignity from democracy, but I rather would go the other way and would uh, define the importance and the meaning of democracy by coming from dignity. Uh, is that sort of an answer to your question? Mais alguém vai. Só enquanto o microfone chega, só fazer uma perguntinha rápida. I have a, a short question. Yeah. É, Para nós, aqui na Procuradoria do Estado, é, tem sido muito comum enfrentar demandas é, em relação ao Estado, não exatamente de que o Estado legisle, não um duty to legislate, mas um duty to provide, ou seja, um dever de fornecer é, os meios materiais para a realização de direito, do direito da dignidade, da dignidade humana e dos direitos fundamentais, a saúde, por exemplo. Né? Então, a gente tem muitas demandas perante o Estado para o fornecimento de medicamentos, e os juízes muitas vezes dizem que a dignidade humana é, impõe que o Estado forneça esses medicamentos. Ao mesmo tempo, de outro lado, o Estado não tem os recursos econômicos para é, concretizar efetivamente todas essas demandas. É, ou seja, de um lado a gente tem a dignidade humana impondo isso, mas de outro lado a gente não tem os meios necessários. Como é, como é que esse tipo de demanda é tratado? Existe esse tipo de demanda na Alemanha e, e como isso é tratado pelas cortes alemãs? We have these questions too, maybe not in the number and the magnitude of a country like Brazil, but we have these questions too. We would not treat them under dignity. Yeah. We would treat them under maybe right to life, maybe right to health. They are named rights in the Constitution in combination with the, we don't have social and economic rights different from your Constitution, but we have a clause, a general clause, a general principle. Germany is a, is a social state. So we would, uh, we would interpret and give meaning to right to life, right to health, etc., via this uh, uh, social state uh, clause. And then uh, maybe reach decisions similar to your court, but I think the German court is more reluctant uh, than the Brazilian court is. And I think the reason is that the German court is more reluctant at if I give, say, I think you had the cases of uh, someone uh, threatened with death if he didn't get an extremely uh, costly uh, treatment. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the court would say there may be thousands and thousands in the same situation. And uh, so this is uh, not a single uh, problem, but this is a, 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 a big social deficit. And in this situation, it's not the business of the courts to do that. Uh, 
So what the court does if a situation like this arises, the court says the government has to concern <laughs> itself with that problem and has to report what it does about that problem. But the court would not uh, grant direct benefits unless, I think the court did it once, uh, but there the court was rather clear, the case was so unusual uh, that one could see this is not a problem of a magnitude that the whole budget of the state has to be changed after uh, that. Yeah. So uh, the court uh, granted uh, a person an extremely costly uh, treatment uh, knowing uh, that maybe the cases in which this appears uh, uh, are two in, uh, in a million or so. But if it is, so I think I, I, I try to make a dis distinction myself between uh, uh, small social de deficits and big social deficits. Uh, small social deficits, for instance, if, if the state in social security laws or alike laws uh, gives benefits to certain groups of the population and forgets a group that is in the same situation. Then we would say this is a matter of equality and now legislature, either you expand it to this forgotten group or if you don't want to do that, then take it away altogether. Uh, and uh, another deficit, uh, another small uh, uh, deficit uh, uh, would be uh, 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 if the state has failed for a long period to adjust its benefits to the costs of life. So we had a, we had a case where the non yet recognized asylum seekers, the, the money that they get, the benefits that they get, had not been adjusted to costs of life over 20 years. Uh, so the court said this is clearly uh, a, a violation uh, of r right to life and health in combination with the social state. A big social deficit, I would say, is if you don't have housing, uh, India or South Africa, where housing is still one of the most important problems. The problem is of such a magnitude. It is clearly, it is clearly so that it is a deprivation of the most important life means of people. But uh, I think the German court wouldn't be prepared, and also the Indian and the South African court are not prepared to say, give all the money to housing, of course the government would say and tell me where should I take it away, defense or agriculture or what? security, traffic, where should I take it away? So these courts say, and I think my court would be prepared to do the same, government you have a duty to do something about that problem and tell us what you plan to do about that problem, but not more. Bom dia. É, eu queria fazer uma pergunta a respeito da, do que foi dito mais no início da palestra, onde o conceito de dignidade ele é oriundo de uma experiência, pode-se dizer, traumática em relação aos governos totalitários que as diversas nações tiveram. Considerando que é uma resposta histórica a um fato concreto, vivido, é, por que, que as nações, pelo menos a gente tem visto nas, nos últimos anos, estão insistindo em retornar para práticas totalitárias e a gente vê o, um crescente movimento de uma de um totalitarismo de uma de uma de um extremismo em quase em nível mundial como a gente está gravando vou só pedir para você falar o seu nome ah, desculpa meu nome é Bárbara obrigado Bárbara e o Rodrigo Valadão foi quem fez a primeira pergunta Uh, uh, I, s I see this happening with uh, 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 much sorrow. Even member states of the European Union turn to autocratic systems. We would never have expected it, and the European Union has no means because it didn't foresee uh, the case. Uh, uh, but it's not, it's, it's an uh, overall tendency uh, in the world. Uh, and the question is, uh, are constitutions able to do something in that situation. Uh, I have a number of cases in mind where uh, uh, populist political parties with a tendency to an autocratic regime away from pluralist democracy, the first thing they did was uh, uh, an attempt 
to uh, eliminate the constitutional courts. Yeah. Either fill the courts, change the laws of the court, fill the courts with people who are loyal to the government, or if that doesn't work immediately, change the rules for constitutional courts so that they are more or less paralyzed. Where political parties with these ambitions have uh, 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 won a an, an, uh, uh, majority in an election that even allows them to change the constitution. This is the case, for instance, in Hungary. The uh, populist Hungarian uh, party got, uh, in a free election, 56% of the votes that translated into a two-thirds majority of seats. So they immediately prohibit, uh, abolished the existing constitutions and wrote a new constitution, which is more or less the party program now turned into constitutional law. And they perpetuate uh, their power, uh, even if they should lose an election, uh, uh, if the party that wins the election does not itself then get a two-thirds majority, they will be helpless. They are fettered. They are limited. So this is what I see happening, and I feel I find it extremely uh, burdensome. And my question is, and this is, I, I give the question back to you because I don't have a, a good answer. Uh, I'm afraid that constitutions do not really help. If we are in a system where parties of that sort or politicians of that sort don't seek a regime change away from a pluralist democracy to an autocratic regime, if they don't seek a regime change, <coughs> I think that the Constitution has a certain chance to survive, and constitutional courts have a certain chance uh, to rule also against uh, uh, the majority. But in these cases that you have in mind, I think constitutions do not help very much. The only, the only way to give constitutions strength in this situation is that they have a lot of backing, of support in society. But a society that gives an autocratic party two-thirds majority is not uh, apparently very much interested in upholding uh, the system. So this is a, I'm, I regret to say it, but this is not a very promising and optimistic answer to your question. É, eu queria formular um questionamento com relação ao caráter absoluto do princípio da dignidade da pessoa humana. Uh, a atribuição da, desse caráter à, à dignidade da pessoa humana é um mecanismo utilizado como proteção da dignidade da pessoa humana. Ela é imponderável. Mas é interessante perceber que, em que pese ela ser um mecanismo de proteção, em termos concretos, a experiência do Tribunal Constitucional Alemão demonstra, na verdade, que há uma contradição. Ela não é um meio efetivo de proteção. Não por outra razão, ela não é um mecanismo, ela não é uma razão de decidir utilizada autonomamente. Você precisa se valer de outras regras jurídicas para aí sim poder decidir em maneira favorável. Em que pese a própria dignidade da pessoa humana funcionar como um vetor interpretativo. Então, o meu questionamento, na verdade, é se essa utilização, essa caracterização da dignidade da pessoa humana como uma regra jurídica, e não mais até para alguns doutrinadores, princípio, não seria uma certa contradição com a sua própria finalidade? Pode se identificar, por favor. Clara, como de Moreira. Se, vamos supor, eu fui convidado para dar advogados a um país que escreve uma nova Constituição e quer adotar a dignidade dignity. I don't know whether I would recommend uh, that it be adopted as absolute right. Yeah. There is no necessity to do that. But I understand that in Germany, after this extremely deep fall after the Nazi regime, Germany was looking for something that should be absolute and should by no means be relativized. Uh, uh, so for my country, I think it may have been an important and a good idea, and I defend it. Uh, but uh, countries with uh, less terrible experiences, with a little more normal life, or with uh, autocratic uh, regimes that were not uh, as bad as the uh, Nazis, 
uh, you may have dignity and it will play a very important role without having it as, as an absolute right. Yeah. So I don't plead for dignity as absolute right. I show we have it, I show why we have it, and I say if you have it, you get a number of problems, which I described. And uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, if, if we take the, the outcome of the polls in the theater, the guilty or non-guilty door, uh, uh, it seems that uh, at least not, not, not every German goes to watch a theater play, but uh, uh, the number was quite big. You see that when it comes to practical problems, uh, 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 it is uh, apparently problematic. I had the same experience uh, uh, when uh, in the events after 9-11, there was again a talk about torture. Should port torture absolutely be prohibited or should, be, should there be exceptions? And uh, if I gave talks uh, to audiences that were not necessarily legal audiences, and I talked about uh, the prohibition of torture in the abstract, everybody agreed and said torture should never happen. And when I came to concrete cases like this one here, uh, they said, oh, in this case, you, you should torture. Of course you should torture. Yeah. Uh, and this was uh, an interesting experience for me. And uh, uh, again, there may be good arguments. Uh, torture is only another example. There may be good arguments uh, to say I adopt dignity, but not as, as absolute. Bom dia, professor. Meu nome é Fernanda Lemos, sou residente aqui da casa. E um dos textos do senhor, ele, ele foi indicado na bibliografia do mestrado da Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, pelo professor Luiz Roberto Barroso. E na uma das nossas primeiras aulas, ele também indica o texto do senhor sobre direito e política, e dessa tênue fr fronteira entre direito e política. E um tema que é muito discutido aqui no Brasil sobre a dignidade da pessoa humana é a dignidade da pessoa humana como heteronomia, como valor comunitário. E existe uma decisão do Tribunal Federal Alemão de, uma, é, de um caso de uma mulher que fazia um striptease e não foi concedida licença para essa casa porque ela fazia... E, havia um, uma tela, ela não poderia ver a pessoa, yeah, 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 yeah. correto? Yeah. Eu queria saber quais são os perigos, porque existe uma escritora, salvo engano, norte-americana, Stefania, que ela fala sobre os perigos da dignidade como heteronomia, como valor comunitário, e não como dignidade como autonomia. E eu gostaria de saber do senhor a sua opinião, se há realmente esse perigo de se ver a dignidade como heteronomia. Obrigada, quero dizer que era uma, é uma honra para mim estar aqui. Eu estou extremamente nervosa. Não estou conseguindo nem... Ah, Percebe-se pelo tom da minha voz. É uma honra agradecer o Anderson, professor. Muito obrigada por nos oportunizar essa palestra. Muito obrigada. Esse é o segundo famous uh, uh, case. Uh, about dignity where you can have doubts whether it is. The, the most important one is a French case about uh, a dwarf throwing. You know that, yeah? Uh, now, uh, the, 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 the other case, the, the, the peep show case, uh, was a German case, but it didn't arrive in the constitutional court. Uh, it was decided in the administrative court, and it didn't uh, go uh, further. Uh, but the dwarf throwing case uh, went through all instances of the French courts and then to the European Court of Human Rights. So this uh, had, was a long way. Uh, and uh, 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 from, the, from the municipality uh, that prohibited throwing the dwarf to the European Court of Human Rights, all instances said that is a violation of dignity. The dwarf himself said, well, it's, uh, I make my life by being thrown. I don't mind. And uh, I'm, I'm trained, I'm well trained, and uh, it pays quite well. So why don't we take, I have no, not much other alternatives, why do you take away my possibility to make a living? Uh, and I find that there is some argument, uh, because normally uh, if, some, if some behavior is the result of a free will decision of the person, 
then we would hesitate normally to say, but your free will uh, is limited. That's to say your right is turned against yourself. And the same is true with, uh, uh, with the peep show. The peep show even more. I mean, I was less, I was less appalled by the peep show uh, uh, problem. Uh, and as you said, there's even the, the woman didn't see the, the spectators. The spectators saw through a lens. Uh, and uh, uh, this is even, uh, even clearer. So uh, again, I would be hesitant. And this is, uh, this is really a message that I think if we have something like dignity, we should reserve it for the most extreme assaults. Uh, uh, to uh, human personhood and autonomy. And I probably would have decided both cases in another way uh, and not decided them uh, under terms of dignity uh, uh, and would have thought are other fundamental rights violated. And then even more the question is, uh, can, I, can I limit, can I, can I, can I turn the right to uh, the, the, the liberty against the one who makes use of the liberty? Tem tempo para uma última pergunta? Uma última pergunta para o professor. Alô. Boa tarde, professor. Antes de mais nada, muito obrigada pela palestra. É, Luciana, eu sou analista da casa. E eu faço, na verdade, mais uma, uma curiosidade aqui em relação ao tema atual, que eu acho que é um dos temas que tem muito preocupado não só a Europa, como o mundo todo, que é em relação ao direito migratório. É, eu tenho a curiosidade, até gostaria que o senhor me, me informasse, se já existe algum posicionamento em termos de direito internacional, na corte europeia, ou algum, enfim, alguma decisão de âmbito internacional em relação ao posicionamento alemão em relação à questão da dignidade humana considerada ao direito migratório. Ou seja, simplificando, a minha curiosidade é a seguinte, para o direito alemão, para o tribunal alemão e para a jurisprudência alemã, a dignidade humana alemã é igual à dignidade humana tcheca, francesa, africana, enfim, como é que a Alemanha se comporta em relação ao direito internacional e ao constitucional alemão em relação aos direitos migratórios? Muito obrigado. Uh, as, as far as I can see, we don't have European decisions about uh, uh, about about that. Uh, the, uh, Germany was in a uh, uh, in a particularly difficult situation uh, in 2015, when in a period of time of uh, some three or four months, almost one million of refugees came. So. I'm totally sure that a number of them were treated in an undignified way. Uh, this is over, uh, but uh, uh, within three months, uh, uh, getting shelter and uh, uh, sufficient food and what else to one million of people. Germany has a population of some 80 million, so one million is, is something. Uh, so I think this... Uh, 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 I don't think that uh, uh, this was a good performance and it took some time, but this is over. And I think it may be excusable if you are so overwhelmed uh, by a development which you did not uh, foresee. Uh, now the number of refugees uh, that yeah, who are coming is much smaller. This million of people, more or less, they stay in, uh, in Germany up to now. Uh, uh, many recognized as asylum uh, seekers, other getting a lower status uh, of protection. Uh, and uh, I think that their life is not great, but I think there is no violation of dignity uh, uh, anymore. Uh, the question now is, but I, I have to say that uh, uh, the, price, the price that uh, uh, Germany had to pay uh, for the acceptance of so many refugees, of which I'm, I'm, I'm fi it's, it's fine with me, I found it an important political decision to say these people are standing at our border and we cannot leave them uh, there to weather conditions, to fame, etc. Let's come them in. Uh, the price was high because uh, now uh, we also have a 
populist, nationalist, anti-pluralist political party, which we would maybe have uh, without the refugees, but without the refugees, they would probably get uh, 2% of the votes in the election, but now they get 12% in the election. And my, my guess is that it will not uh, just be the case for a, uh, a few more months or years, but they will be a lasting political force. Uh, so the price was high, but nevertheless, I think that the humanistic way of tackling that problem in 2015 uh, uh, was right, and I defend it. Uh, well knowing uh, that not everything could, uh, could be done in, the, in a decent way in such a short period of time. Is that sort of an answer? Okay. Bom, então vamos agradecer ao professor Dieter Green por a excelente palestra e pela simpatia e por ter atendido a todas essas nossas perguntas, esclarecido os temas.